The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. This week, I have the absolute pleasure of talking to the AFA Financial Advisor of the Year, the newly crowned AFA Advisor of the Year, I should say, Felicity Hooper. From today's chat, you'll see that it is very evident why she was the winner of this year's Advisor of the Year. It's clear to me that she spends an enormous amount of time on herself, around self-reflection, around personal improvement, personal learning, and that has just permeated into her business. So I wanted to learn what is she doing, how is she doing it, and what secrets can she share with us at the XY community. Enjoy. Hi, Felicity. Hi, Jess. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited for today's conversation. I have lots of And lots of things that I want to ask you. And I'm going to try to do it in a logical, sequential way so that people who are playing along at home can follow with me because I like to go on crazy tangents because I want to basically know all of the cool things that you're doing because the industry, we're going to learn a little bit more about you, but you are winning so many awards and upfront and massive congratulations to you, Advisor of the Year. Thank you very much. I was a bit chuffed with that one. I didn't really expect that. So exciting. So obviously, I want to use the time that we have together to learn so much more about you, so much more about what you've built, um, the business itself and the client experience. But yeah, we're going to talk about the awards piece as well, because just from looking at your website, you are obviously doing something amazing because this is not the first award that you've won um, and perhaps it won't be the last. But before we get into all of that, For those people that do not know you, can we talk a little bit more about who you are and your story? Sure. So I think I was never going to be a financial planner. I mean, Mm -hmm. I I was going to be an accountant and then Mm -hmm. I ended up being a stockbroker and so I worked with a couple of the big firms, so JB Weir, Goldman Sachs, Macquarie, Morgans. Somewhere Mm -hmm. along the line there I went, why am I doing stockbroking? It's one tiny piece of the puzzle. Mm. and morphed into financial planning and then eventually six months six years ago I went uh, actually I'm just going to go and set up my own firm and so self-licensed six years ago mm-hmm. and loving I was going to say every single second of it but probably 90% of it. Thank you for being honest and authentic. Um, so just a quick one did you jump out of stockbroking straight into your own business or when you say you moved into financial advice did you go and work in another business first? Well, really, I did my first, I think back then it was the DFP, Mm -hmm. um, 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was always there and I was always half giving the advice around the stockbroking component, but it's not really until six years ago that I said, you know what, I am not a stockbroker, I am a financial planner. And so from that, took yourself out of a broking world and straight into your own business? You are just as crazy as me. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. Wonderful. Okay. So six years ago, you started the business. What does the business look like now? 
Uh, so we now have nine staff, so three advisors, two power planners, two CSO and administration. Mm -hmm. Busy is how it looks. That is, a, that is a busy world. You're on the Gold Coast, correct? Yeah, based on the Gold Coast, but we've got clients all around the country now. Yeah, okay. And did you take, um, did broken clients follow you or did you start from scratch? Pretty much started from scratch. So I've got a few of those broken clients, um, but really, particularly when I left Macquarie, they had some pretty good anti-compete clauses in mm -hmm. their contract, which mm -hmm. uh, kind of meant I had to start from scratch anyway. Yeah, right. And where is the business at now? Have you um, reached the level of growth that you were hoping for and you're just hoping to enjoy those beautiful Gold Coast sunshine days or is this still on, in growth phase? So we're definitely still in growth phase, but probably not at the rate that we've done in the past. So, you know, kind of did the first few years by just brute force and mm. now it's trying to get a little bit more balance between growing business but also having a life. I've got a 15-year-old daughter, so, mm. you know, quite conscious now of the fact that, you know, she gets a driver's licence in nine months and, you know, I've got limited time now to enjoy that. And we always tell our clients, you know, why are you doing all of this? And I think sometimes as advisors we have to stop and ask ourselves the same question. I don't think we do that enough. No, I don't think so either. Mm. Mm. Okay. How much of your time at the moment is spent running the business versus seeing clients? So we, um, we're a little different, I think, to most planning practices. So we don't do reviews through the whole year. We have a concept called surge, which means that we see all clients twice a year in big chunks, which means that then outside that, I can do all the cool things and build the business and work on the business and answer client concerns or questions as they come up, but we're quite proactive. So we see clients February and March and then again in um, August, September, we do it all in six weeks, seven client appointments a day, and then it's done. Hey, we do that. I've never you known do. another business. Yeah, we do it more than you because we're crazy. I've never met another business that does this and yep. I, and I don't think we've done it 100 I don't think we do it as good as we could. So, you are going to explain in much more detail how you do this because I think the efficiency gain from doing this is enormous. Um but let's break it down. So, you've got how many clients do you think you would have now as a business? Uh so let's say advisors can have up to 150 clients. Mhm. Mm so that way we can see all clients over six weeks. And pre-surge, is that a thing? Is that what you call it? Yep. Surge prep. I don't know how you <laughs> – who does that work? How do you prepare so that surges are successful? So firstly, clients know that that's how we do it. So I think yep. that's kind of step one is make sure that they're aware of the process. So yep. they get sent a calendar invite electronically six weeks before we start surge. Yep. And they book themselves in for their meeting. The moment that they book themselves in, we go to a fact find check. So we ask them to check their fact find, tell them what our agenda is and ask them if there's anything that they want covered on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So from there, then we do all the file prep, any ROAs, SOAs that we think that we'll need to do, given that they've also told us what's on their mind. Uh, meetings are 75 minutes long. Straight after that, we've got the file note. Like it's all very regimented, I, mean, I guess. Is it just an advisor in the meeting? Yep, just advisor yep. in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And we've built um, Word Wizards. So it just asks us for prompts to put in the right areas into our file notes. Copy of that goes to the client. Copy of it goes to the CSO. They pick it up and start putting in all the tasks. The client gets your file notes as you would write them. Pretty much. So we have a, a file note that goes to the client. We email that, reopen it, and then just edit anything in there that needs to go to the CSO or that needs to be added from a more compliance aspect. Emails it off, goes directly to XPlan, CSO puts in client tasks, our tasks, and you know they're getting a follow-up within 24 hours and we're done. Amazing. How do you do the SOAs ahead of time? Uh, so only what we can do ahead of time. So, But because we're asking a client, so firstly we're seeing them every six months 
and then we'll have client service points in between that. So we really know in advance for most clients what it is that we're going to be looking at in six months' time. So every mm. surge will have what's our future consideration. Is there something that we'll have to have a look at for next time? So we might know that you need more cash or, you know, mum and dad are going into aged care or, you know, we know that your binding death nomination is going to expire in that time or your driver's license or you're going to hit pension age, whatever it is. So because it's just that constant rotation, we know 90% of it. And then we're asking them what their agenda is. Mm. So, you, I mean, you imagine if somebody comes into you and you haven't asked them what's on your mind at the moment, you have your own agenda and they can come in and go, but that's, that's not what is important to me right now. What I'm really having to deal with is the fact that, you know, I've got a child that's gone off the rails or we're going to get a divorce, whatever it is. Whereas mm. imagine how different that is if they come into the meeting and you go, I know we had an agenda, but you said this was going on. And here's some preliminary thoughts I already have around that. And I've done the work already. And then we can just make a quick little ROA out of it afterwards. I love that you do this. I haven't heard of another business that does this. Did you get this? Like, how did you come up with this this concept and how has it evolved to be what it is today for you? Well, I think the first time I heard about it was actually on a podcast, one of the Michael Kitzer's podcasts. Okay. And... I have a coach over in the US who also, so over there, quite a lot of advisors use it. It's just not something that is wide, like widely used here. So I did quite a lot of research on it, tried it, broke it, redid it. So, What do you mean broke you it? Let's, let's talk about what you've learned throughout the process of doing it. Like what have you tried that you were like, no, for us, this wasn't the right thing. So we moved to this style or this way. Well, I think, and again, it's something that our firm is really good at, is breaking things purposefully. So if I have a look at the way that we did Surge, for example, so we set up boards as well in the office called Band-Aids and Breakdowns. So everything that doesn't work, we keep a record of it so that at the end of it, we can say what worked, what didn't, how are we going to fix it, fix it, put it away until the next time it comes around. So it's always an evolution of how do we do it better but for example, the first time we did it, the online scheduling system didn't work properly. Um, the emails didn't go out to clients. We actually had an email go to a deceased client. That wasn't very much fun. Mm. Um, you know, then we had two people wanting to join Zoom meetings. We'd never had multiple Zoom meetings or a way that they could send an invite to another person. So now we have that process. Um, we were just writing file notes after meetings and then we said that's just taking forever and we've got 15 minutes between meetings. How do we make sure that it happens in that time? Mm. Um, preparation time. And then there's also we left no room for prospect meetings. So, you know, you get to the end of six weeks and go, well, where's the new client flow? Yeah. Oh, I kind of forgot about that bit. You know, no wonder there's no new clients. We haven't seen anybody new for six weeks. We've just worked. So what are you doing now? How do you manage uh, that now? So now we only see clients Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So Mondays are prep and new clients. Fridays are get through anything that didn't get done and new clients. So we now actually top, top and tail the process. And have you found that that's worked quite successfully in terms of balancing the new business and the existing client surge requirements? Yep. But it's also balanced mental health a little bit more too. You can imagine if you try and do that five days in a row for six weeks, um, by the end of six weeks, everyone's a little frazzled, myself included. I'm smiling and nodding because that's what we do and it's yep. so exhausting. And actually um, to the point where the team can get a bit overwhelmed in anticipation for the work that's coming because they know that this is this huge lump of work. And look, um, we're not here to talk about what I do, but we've made some efficiency changes as well. But from a business perspective, if you can get it right, as you say, it then frees up so much other time that you would be spending on reviews throughout the year. So what does that, what does that surge period enabled you to do when you're not doing those surges? Tell me how you have balanced your life or found the secret to work-life balance and profitability and all the things that business owners want to see and hear people achieve. I think when you think about it, it gives you 40 weeks of the year that you're not doing review meetings in. So we then, I'm a big believer that consistency compounds. 
So then we use that time for different client service schedules that are more proactive. So for example, we're reviewing everybody's wills and estate planning at the moment. We might do um, everybody's tax preparation, well we will do everybody's tax preparation in May and June. So it means that we can focus on those things and also then be very um, timely in responses when clients need us outside that normal planning cycle. So, you know, we're financial planners, we're not firefighters, so it lets us put the right thing in the right boxes. But it also then means that we can take that same process and apply it to the other things in the business. So whether it's kind of a mini marketing surge, where now we're going to make all of our video content in two weeks, because we don't need to be doing all the client reviews. Um, so it just, it just actually means that we can plan out pretty much a whole year in advance. And then in school holidays, I pretty much work half time because we don't surge during school holidays ever. Amazing. So you get to have quite a lot of time off or time with your child or time to do you things that are important to you. Yep. There would be a lot of people that don't do this that would be scared to move to it because maybe their clients are used to having their reviews in a certain month and they've had their reviews in a certain month you know, always or you know, sometimes we've concreted ideas in our mind around, you know, we have to do it this way. What would you say to those people who are not doing surges? That that's a mindset thing. It's not actually a practice thing. It's just a mindset thing. We thought the same thing. Hmm. But in actual fact, when you send out an email that says, there's so much going on in the world at the moment, we'd like to have a catch up. And then that just resets everybody. Hmm. And you go, okay, well, you know, we don't need to really see you again in the next three months, so we'll book something in for August, September. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's done. I think part of the problem is we look at so many things and think clients will judge us or won't like it and we don't try it. Whereas we had 95% of clients book in by themselves, clients that have never booked online before. They just do it. And next time they do it quicker because they want their date and they realized that it all got booked out. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Really exciting. Congratulations. That's fantastic. And no doubt because you've built in extra time to have that level of proactivity on other elements of the advice. So as you say, clients come with their agenda, but of course we have other things that we want to also make sure that they do properly and having the time throughout the year to get an element of proactivity in on that is no doubt hugely valuable. I'm trying to say, I think I can see why you're winning awards, lots of awards. Congratulations. I'd love to understand how the awards journey has been for you because there's been some big awards where you've been on road shows and, you know, it's been a lot of time out of the business as well. So I'm keen to understand how did the awards come about? I know that um, a lot of people self-nominate. That's awesome. Other people get nominated. And what's the impact been for you, good, bad, and indifferent along the journey? I think for us, well, for me anyway, the first awards were there just to help me get over my own imposter syndrome. Really? Yeah. Am I, yeah, am I actually doing this, particularly when you have your own business? You don't have the peers to bounce off for mm. the external people. You're probably not seeing as many other plans that you can then judge yourself against. Mm. So I think the first time was just almost to go through that peer review process of, I think we're doing okay, but I'm going to put it out there. And if I'm not, well, I'm going to find out really quickly. And if we're doing it really well, then... I'll find out really quickly. So, and I just think the process of awards is so fantastic. So I was actually talking to an advisor on the weekend and they said, you know, I've gone to fill in all of the awards submissions before and I get halfway through and it's just so hard and so I don't do it. Mm. And I said to them, I think maybe just change the perspective on it a little bit that you're not actually doing it so that you win an award. You do it because it gives you time to self-reflect. So if you get a question that says, you know, what's your process for new clients? And you can't answer that for this submission, then you've now got an opportunity to go, oh, I couldn't really answer that. I might mm -hmm. go away, question that myself, redefine that and make sure that next time I do something like this, I have a really good answer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that process that it gives you of being able to self-score along the way. And when you had imposter syndrome and you were putting yourself forward, still have it. you still have it? Still have it. 
Felicity, you're advisor of the year. Yep. Still have it. Oh, still have that cool. moment where I tell myself it's only six people in a room and maybe I just had a good day. We need to pause on this. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for validating probably how 99.999% of us think a lot. Did the recent award change the imposter syndrome for you? No. Fascinating. Human beings are fascinating. Aren't we fascinating? So I think this is an enormously important message. It's scary and you have to be brave and do something despite the fear. Because clearly, no matter how successful you are, no matter how many awards you're winning, we still have this teeny tiny voice that lives within us that's like, "Ah, are you sure? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're good enough or ready enough or worthy enough or whatever it is. And that clearly doesn't go away with all of the definitions that we put on success. Well, not only that, though, you know, it is success isn't an award. Success is, for me anyway, about having work-life balance and a sustainable business and clients that I like to work with and hanging out with my family. So it's not this single facet thing that makes you successful or not successful. But again, it's that mindset thing. You know, we have talks about how much do people charge for their advice? Mm. And one of the things that I get feedback on is you just don't charge enough. And I look at it, so, you know, we're not big fee charges. Mm. But again, that, that's just a mindset thing. I'm sure we could charge more if we asked for it. Mm. It's, um, firstly, completely agree with you. Society puts emphasis on these success parts of our lives, these live, these live milestones that are meant to I- indicate whether we are a successful human or not. And they often are driven by status and by, you know, um, titles and income that we then derive our worth from, which is so silly because actually what is happiness and success to one person is completely different to the other. But clearly what I've learned is that from you today, we can have all of the hallmarks of success in a corporate business ownership perspective and still have something inside of us that needs to be overcome and a good reminder that success is not wedded to that. You might do an award process and move no further forward in the journey and that's okay. That's fine. How has your coach helped you? Can you talk a little bit more about coaching and mentoring and this cumulative or compounding um, benefit? It sounds to me like you're quite a dedicated, diligent person and I'm keen to learn more. Yeah, so I think it's funny. I am dedicated and diligent, but I also look for places and opportunities to improve all the time. So, you know, I I have my own notebook of all the cool ideas of cool things that we could do that would make processes better. So things that would make life better for clients, for business or for me. And the notebook gets very, very full. But it's funny that one of my friends said, oh, you just did such and such. I remember you spoke about that three years ago. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea, Felicity, and you'll never do it. But it's just tucked away and when I have time, it will come to life. So it's about being patient through the process but not giving up. Giving up. So I think that's that consistency compounds piece is that you're not going to get it all done all at once. You just change one thing at a time and know that next time you do it a little bit better and a little bit more. But you would know it in your business. There's lots of things that you try and they just don't work, whether it's marketing, new coding in an SOA, you know, mm-hmm. a way that you're going to present to clients. But the idea is, is you try it, you take the bit that works and then you build on that again. And has a coach helped you throughout all of this? Or like, when did you get a business coach? Uh, only six months ago. Oh. But- So I've never had one before that. So only six months ago. And for me, it's been a game changer. So she works just with financial planners. And that has been a game changer in that she just calls me on my bullshit. So when I say I can't do that, clients will never do that. A little bit like Serge. Clients are never going to do that. They're busy. They don't want to fit in with our timetable and our schedule. They want it done on their schedule. So that's just a story you tell yourself. Give it a go. If 30% of people don't book, then yes, you've got a problem. See how it goes. Okay. See how it goes. And so it's it's so fascinating to me that um, this business coach concept for you is 
so new given how much success I know you've had for such a long period. So congrats on doing that by yourself. That's a, that's amazing. Was there um, a reason why you decided, okay, now is the time I want a business coach or did someone offer you someone's information and that's how you sort of got onto it? What led you to get a business coach? It was just life was hectic. Mm. So, you know, you can get so busy in planning especially. I think mm. you take so much on of what clients are doing and want to be all things to all people. Yeah. So I was juggling the business, being a planner, being a mum, not having any time off. And I actually got to a point where I said, I'm not having fun anymore. This isn't, I don't even know if I want to do this. I don't mm. sleep. You know, mm. we've got 30 ROAs in the pipeline that we haven't got done. Yeah. Like, there just has to be a better way for me to do this. And so that's why I then looked for people that could show me others that have done it differently and better or differently. I think we've all got different ways of doing it and there's no such thing as a right way. Yeah. But I look at it and go, why not learn from somebody else's mistakes? sometimes and not have to make all of them myself. <laughs> I can make my fair share to contribute yep. to the community, but I don't need to make all of them. I like that, I like that a lot. And so was it um, intentional to get a coach from the US or how did that come about? Uh, it wasn't intentional. I didn't really know anyone here. Okay. And I do like the idea of whether it's taking ideas from other industries mm. or taking ideas from other markets. So they might not have the same regulations as us or the same compliance or the same processes or requirements, but they do have the same challenges. Mm -hmm. So if you look at you know, client service, for example, you can learn a lot from things like the Hilton Group or hotels or you know, different areas altogether. If you look at the way that your website works, you can look at the different user interface that happens in other industries that we're not using in financial planning. So I think it's just, again, looking for a coach that does something different that you know, is in a completely different market that then also has none of their own biases of this is the way that you do it is just challenging me to think very differently. Did you have to date a few coaches to find the right one or were you lucky and you found one? And I was really yeah. lucky. The only thing I'm not lucky about is it means that every Tuesday morning I'm up at three o'clock in the morning to hop on a call. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such dedication. You must really love your coach. <laughs> so, Do you go back I mean, to bed? My partner and I have to sleep separately on Monday nights so that I can get up and yeah. not wake the whole family up. Yeah. You don't go to work after that, do you? You go back to yep. bed. No, no, so, I go to work. Wow. That gives me that finishes at around four thirty. So then gives me an hour to an hour and a half where I can take notes from that and make changes. So actually implement some of the things that I'm thinking about before then the family gets up at six and then off I go. That's actually a very cool, I mean, it's crazy that you get up literally in the middle of the night to have the call, but just thinking through the idea that you straight after the meeting have beautiful, precious, uninterrupted time. No one call Felicity at 4.30 on a Tuesday morning now that you know that she's awake. Do not do that. That's very mean. But you're actually making change instantly after as much as you can after that call yep that's right otherwise you can just get it's a bit like conferences they're awesome but you come away with 500 million things that you could do mm -hmm. and then how many of them do you actually do whereas if you could just take the one thing again just one thing at a time consistently six months it's not a it's not a long stretch of time but how has it changed you how has it changed the business and that idea of like, I'm not enjoying this. Is this for me? How am I going to keep doing this? What's changed in that short space of time? Oh, I think it's changed a lot. So processes, we're a lot more processed and systemized now, which okay. just helps me a lot. I don't feel quite as manic. I think mm -hmm. I was starting to get actually a bit manic with the whole thing. Okay. Um, so now it's just what's the most important thing to do? What can wait? What's important and urgent? Mm -hmm. What's important but not urgent? What's mm -hmm. not important and not urgent? Yeah. And what is really just not important and not urgent at all that you really just don't have to worry about at the moment? Um, before that, I had actually worked with a coach a couple of years ago that was more on change management. So she was a psychologist yeah. that dealt with um, corporate change management. So 
Mm. She would run experiments with me of if I said, I just don't think I could do that. She'd say, well, you know, what would happen if you actually thought that you could do that? What, what would you do differently if you looked at yourself in the mirror and went, actually, if I want to act like a successful financial planner, what would that person do? And then emulate that rather than it's a, what am I going to do? So, which is big, you know, like the, the power of habit. That's one of the things that they say in habit forming is, you know, if you want to be healthy, don't worry about what food you would eat so much. Worry about, well, what would a healthy person do? Mm. And, and just try So it's a lifestyle thing and it's an identity thing rather than an action-driven thing. I'm quietly smiling over here because I feel like you must have been listening to a conversation that I was having with a very, very dear friend two Saturdays ago where we had exactly this conversation and it was about wrapping habits and behaviors around an identity of, you know, who do I want to be and how would someone who is like that show up? How would someone like that behave? And I know it's from a, a very famous book, it completely stopped me in my tracks. And over the last few weeks, I've made some really significant habit changes because I keep thinking about this idea of identity. And if I want to be this person, a person who is like that does this. So I've just got to do this because that's how I get there. Are we on the same page? Absolutely. Mm. Yep. So it's not, yeah, it's not the actual little action. It's the what does that identity do? If I'm going to be that person, then I have to own the identity of that person. Why don't we learn this stuff? Honestly, the things that we learn at school, no financial literacy, nothing about this, both wildly helpful in real life, wildly, wildly helpful. So it sounds like you had some work years ago on managing that part. Yep. And that, now you've got the coach who sounds like it's more um, business process improvement, helping take what's out of your head onto paper so that it's replicable and consistent and not having to be worried about from you from a manic perspective. Do you see that this business coach will be someone that you use for a short period of time indefinitely? I think I'll keep doing it until I feel that I don't get anything out of it, which means I'll probably be there for life because there's always more to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if I change, it would be because I want another perspective, not, yeah. not anything to do with the coach, but just a, is there another perspective that I could add to this? And I'm sure. not going to get up at three o'clock in the morning, two times a week. So I can only have one. <laughs> <laughs> we have limits, people. I like it. I like it a lot. So on your six-year journey, obviously you've learned a lot coming from a broken background. I can't imagine the, the change that that would mean, um, you know, building yourself and also the business. What are your biggest learnings for someone who might feel like it's their time to step into their own thing and do it? the way that they want to do it. Just give it a shot. Seriously, what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm. Yeah. You decide that you don't like it that, and that's not a failure thing either. You give it a go, you don't like it. Okay. You learn something from it, go and work for somebody else again. Yeah. I think we're sometimes very um, – we ask a lot for um, our clients to be courageous. We ask them to make um, decisions that might be out of their comfort zone or we try to teach them about risk and I often feel like, we're not overly good at doing it ourselves when we need to be brave and do that. Um, on your journey, have you done anything that if you had, I mean, obviously you will have had things that you would do again differently. Any really big learnings that you would like to sort of share with the community? I think it didn't have to be as hard as it was. So I, I think, you know, if I'd got a coach earlier or if I'd asked for advice or other people's learnings. I've learned now people will actually share when you ask for it. Okay. So yeah. I didn't have to go and rediscover everything myself. So I probably would have asked for some more help along the way. Because mm, we are a collaborative bunch, which is unusual, I believe. Other professions are not like this. Yep. But not okay. all, all planners are collaborative either. Um, mm. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that I would do. I would. Again, start with the end in mind, which is what I've always done. I've always had a vision of what I want the firm and life to look like. Mm -hmm. so I wouldn't really change that. Um, and I think with the benefit of hindsight, you know, when you're first starting out, it's easy to think you need every client. You know, you've got bills to pay. Every client is a good client. 
And as you go through the journey, you realize not every client is a good client, but not only that, there is actually enough to go around. So I also don't have to protect my own IP or the way that we do things or you know, my client base as if, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna lose them all overnight. You, yeah. you just do the right thing for the right people and there's plenty to go around. Totally, totally, totally. Is there something that you're working on at the moment within the business that you're really excited about? We just built an in-house video studio. Which Sorry? I am super excited about. Say more. So we've always done some videos. We had a little studio, but we've now just built a, I don't know, I think it's a six by eight meter in-house video studio. So fully equipped lighting, mics, cameras, multiple cameras wow. uh, so that we can take that marketing and message to the next level. That's so exciting. How do you feel, like how are you using videos at the moment or how will you be using videos, do you think, with this new setup? So we will start doing interviews with the people behind product and ideas that kind of drive our advice to clients and the way that we do things. So we'll do interview series, but we also mm -hmm. do other things. So the studio has a whole heap of different colored backdrops. So if we're doing a market update, we'll use one backdrop. If we're doing a tech update, we'll do something different. If we're doing a video cast, which is an interview style, then we'll use a different backdrop. Cool. So, so video is going to form much more of a presence in your business than it has in the past? Yep, definitely. And that in itself is a learning curve. And the first time that I did anything, video was a disaster. So it can only get better. <laughs> Bless us. We've got to start somewhere. Absolutely. Preferably turn your sound on though. That's my first tip. If you're going to go and do a live for 45 minutes, turn on your sound. I don't know much about tech, but yes, I would very much agree. Although I'm going to say when I did my first, one of my first XY podcasts, uh, the editor, Kieran, hi Kieran, um, was very panicked after the podcast he called me because I didn't use the right mic. I used a mic that was way away from where we were recording. So I too have made some silly sound mistakes. Um, but you're right. I can fix know. most of it. Yeah. And I was like, they don't want to listen to me anyway. I'm interviewing the guest. It's the guest that needs to be heard. Um, but in all seriousness, now that you, I mean, you've won lots of awards, you do a lot of public speaking, you're about to do more videos, no doubt over the next 12 months being advisor of the year, that's going to come with a lot more opportunity to be profiled and showcased, which is awesome. Did you do any media training or have you done any PR training that you feel like has been necessary or helpful? I think I grew up as a debater. So mm. for me, I was always ready to talk and on my feet. Yeah. But I do know when I won the AFA Excellence in Education Award, they did PR training as part of that. Ah, so okay. that was also very helpful in terms of how do you put an idea into a sentence that isn't going to be used against you as part of the, the training of just that there are places to say some things and other places just not to say some things. Mm. So that was also helpful. But again, I think it's just something you learn over time. Yeah. And do it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And you don't have to be um, without fear to do it. No, otherwise I wouldn't do anything. Same. <laughs> it's so reassuring to know that this is normal because sometimes you wonder, clearly there's something wrong with me. No, actually, it's just no one else is talking about it. We all feel very similar. Yep. Interesting. Um, huge congrats. Seriously, huge congrats on the award. Not just for the award sake, to your point. Whether you win the award or not, you know, obviously people go into it, they'd like to win, but actually having been quite close to the awards process myself, um, I went out and did all of the um, site visits and interviews several years ago. There is so much rigor that exists within that awards framework. And so I'm excited that you won the award because it means that you've got an outstanding business. It means that your compliance is excellent. It means that your clients love you and are very happy to say how amazing you are. Um, and your team, you know, I know that this is not something that happens just um, for one person. It's often a big, you know, collaboration with lots of people. But um, to come from a completely different world and to get advisor of the year in just six years is truly amazing. 
huge congrats to you. And it's going to be so exciting to see what you do over the next 12 months. Um, it's nice to have a female as a Isn't it just? And is it a redheaded female? Well, I, I think we can run with that. Yes! There's not many of us people, so I'm just very excited. It's going to be really exciting for you to, to showcase and platform you know, the good work that you're doing, but also females in advice as well, which is outstanding. So huge congrats. If people want to learn more about what you do, how can people learn Felicity? Uh, for now, just connect in LinkedIn or send mm. me an email. I'm, a, I'm an open book. So if somebody wants to have a chat, reach out, but definitely connect on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Okay. Before we wrap up today's conversation, can I ask you a few rapid fire questions? Yes. Lovely. I ask the same ones every week. So the first one is, what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? Meditate every day. Actually, I also go hiking. That's, that's my big one. So I meditate mm-hmm. daily, 20 minutes a day, and then go hiking whenever I can. Do you meditate at a particular time of day? Do you have someone guide you through that? Do you do it alone? Uh, end of the day, and I use the Waking Up app oh. on my phone. So it's a 20-minute guided meditation. And that, for me, it helps me sleep. So it puts everything back in the right box and goes, okay, work is done, family is done, time to actually get some rest. Amazing. And how often do you go hiking? Often as I can. So I'm actually off tomorrow for a two-day hike. I like multi-day hikes. So, yes, as often as I can, not as much as I'd like. Are you staying out there overnight? Yes. Good on you. That's exciting. Um, a piece of advice that you would give to younger Felicity? Just do it. So my, my favorite saying is get up, dress up, show up, and never give up. Mm. Sometimes you've just got to put your game face on mm-hmm. and do it no matter what you're feeling. Easier said than done, but I like it. I like yes. the advice. I like the advice. Uh, do you have something that's on your bucket list that you haven't done yet? Uh, bucket list? Definitely want to see the Northern Lights. Mm. Preferably from a glass igloo. <gasps> that would get in quick before climate change. I know, right? Mm. That would be so cool. So yes. cool. Yep. Love that. Last question for you. I have a fake book club. Do you have a book that you would recommend for said fake book club? Ooh, so I read a book a week. What? So yes. Oh my gosh, I feel like I have so many more questions for you and it's such a shame. Oh my gosh, she's got all these she's got all these books that she's holding up. Oh my gosh. So you read a book a week. Hold on. You read do you do the thing where you divide the number of pages into 7 days and do that a day or how do you no, do it? I just read a book. So just make sure it's done by the end of the week and start the next one. I'm quite sure that it means that my office administrator hates it because it means every week there's more books that turn up from Amazon. <laughs> Okay, so you read a lot of books. I thought I, I average about one a week and a half, one a fortnight. I yep. thought I was doing well. Boo to me. You I've got are. to get one a week. Um, I don't read one at a time though. I'm one of those really weird people that I've got, I'm reading four books at the moment because I'm obviously mad. Um, but given that you read so much, is this a hard question? Do you have like a standout book? So at the moment, Tell my me. two favorites yeah. is Drive by Daniel Pink. Yeah. And oh. The One Thing by Gary Keller. Are these business books? Uh, they're kind of lifestyle books. So Drive is um, psychology. Yeah. So Daniel Pink talks about um, the truth of what motivates us. And it's not money. It's actually different things for different people. But, yeah, so it's it's about what actually motivates us and therefore helps with discussions with clients about what motivates them. Because you would know you can write the best plan in the world, but if you can't actually get a client to do something, your plan is pretty much worthless. So I quite like those kind of books. Mm. And then the one thing is really just that. What is the one thing that pivots the most at the moment? So just focusing on one thing, not a hundred different things. What is one thing? Beautiful. It's very obvious that you invest time in yourself uh, to make yourself the best version of you and making sure that you're constantly learning and keeping up. And and that means that you've obviously got an amazing business um, off the back of that. So again, thank you so much for being part of today's XY chat. Congratulations. Thank you for having me. And I can't wait to see 
you continue to flourish in the wonderful world that you're in. Congrats. Thanks, Felicity. Thanks very much, Jess.